Beneath the quiet plains of Alberta lies a graveyard where evolution's greatest gamble went catastrophically wrong. Here, in a single patch of ancient riverbed, paleontologists uncovered more than 8,000 skeletons crushed together. Pachirinosaurus lacustae, four-ton giants that once ruled by the strength of their herd. The River of Death holds up to 300 bones in every square meter, a fossil snapshot of sudden doom that Dr. Emily Bamforth calls Paleo Gold. Everything that made these dinosaurs successful, tight social bonds, coordinated migration, unbreakable loyalty, became the fatal mistake that sealed their extinction in minutes. What force could turn evolution's best strategy into a mass grave? And why did it happen here? Pachyhinosaurus lacustae stood nearly seven meters from nose to tail, weighing as much as four tons, about the size of a modern rhinoceros, but built for a different world. Its most striking feature was the massive bony boss that replaced the nose horns seen in other ceratopsians. This thick, rugged structure fused over the snout likely played a role in display or combat, a natural shield rather than a weapon. The skull itself was broad and low, with a sweeping frill that arched behind the head, edged with small knobby projections. Teeth arranged in tight batteries allowed it to shear through tough Cretaceous plants, while the powerful jaw muscles anchored along the skull gave it a surprisingly strong bite for a herbivore. What set this species apart wasn't just its anatomy, but the makeup of its final gathering. Fossils from Pipestone Creek reveal a full spectrum of ages. Tiny juveniles, gangly subadults, fully grown adults, all pressed together in the same layers. Long bone measurements and skull fragments cluster into distinct size groups, confirming that the herd included animals at every stage of life. There are no isolated nurseries or segregated groups, Instead, the bones of young and old are tangled side by side. This pattern points to a social structure where generations moved as a unit. The herd at Pipestone Creek was not a random sampling, but a living cross-section, a family caught in the moment when nature's odds turned against them. Living in large, tightly knit groups gave Pachirinosaurus a powerful edge in the Cretaceous wilds. Herding meant more than just numbers, it was a system of constant surveillance, with dozens of eyes and ears tuned to the slightest threat. Dr. Philip Curry, who has spent decades studying these fossils, interprets this vigilance as a key to their evolutionary success. In a landscape where predators like Albertosaurus hunted in packs, a lone herbivore stood little chance. But a herd could spot danger early, form a defensive wall of massive bodies, and shield the most vulnerable within. The presence of every age class in the bone bed, tiny juveniles, growing subadults, full-grown adults, suggests a social structure where young and old move together, sharing resources and risks. This unity likely extended to migration, with experienced adults guiding the group to new feeding grounds as seasons changed. The regular mixing of ages, confirmed by bone measurements and spatial mapping, points away from isolated nursery herds and toward a single, cohesive unit. While the fossils can't show alarm calls or coordinated defense, the evidence for communal living is strong. In the world of Pachirinosaurus, survival depended on the group. Their cohesion made them resilient, adaptable, and, under most circumstances, safe. But as later evidence would show, the very traits that guarded them from everyday danger could become a fatal weakness when disaster struck. In 1972, a high school science teacher named Al Lacusta set out along the muddy banks of Pipestone Creek, driven by stories of ancient bones surfacing after heavy rains. Lacusta wasn't a professional paleontologist. He was searching for something to spark curiosity in his students. What he found was far beyond a classroom specimen. Half buried in the clay, he spotted a chunk of fossilized bone weathered but unmistakably out of place among the willow roots and river stones. He pried it loose, cleaned it in his bathtub at home, and brought it to the attention of experts at the University of Alberta. When paleontologists arrived to investigate, they realized this wasn't a single fossil, or even a handful. 
The ground at Pipestone Creek was saturated with bones, skulls, ribs, frills, and limb fragments pressed together in tangled layers. Early surveys revealed a staggering density. In some spots, over 300 bones packed into a single square meter. Over the next decades, more than 8,000 fossils would be catalogued from this stretch of the Wapiti Formation, making it the densest dinosaur bone bed ever recorded. The sheer scale of the site was unlike anything else in North America. The fossils spanned all ages, from tiny juveniles to massive adults, and covered more than a square kilometer along the creek. For Lacusta, the discovery was life-changing. His name would eventually be attached to the species itself, Pachirinosaurus lacustae, a tribute to the teacher who turned a chance encounter with ancient bone into one of paleontology's most important finds. The excavation team at Pipestone Creek faced a puzzle unlike any other, a burial ground so densely packed that bones overlapped in every direction, yet some specimens stood out as forensic gold mines. Among them, one skull, nicknamed Big Sam, became the site's unofficial mascot. Nearly complete, with its frill still attached and preserved upside down, Big Sam was uncovered after weeks of careful digging through compacted mudstone. Its position, entombed amid a jumble of ribs and limb bones, hinted at a violent, swirling force that had swept the herd together and flipped massive animals like toys. Field diaries from the Royal Tyrrell Museum crew describe how the sediment surrounding Big Sam was not uniform, but laminated in thin, alternating bands, clear evidence of rapid, pulsed water flow. These layers, only a few centimeters thick, suggest that the floodwaters surged, paused, and surged again, each pulse dumping another load of silt and debris. Bones across the site show no strong preferred orientation, but instead a chaotic vertical stacking, some articulated, most not, all packed by the energy of water rather than the slow work of time. The surfaces of these fossils tell their own story, little weathering, few signs of prolonged exposure, and only occasional marks from scavengers. Most bones are clean, their edges sharp, preserved in the exact moment disaster struck. For the field crew, every extraction was a race against the elements. Spring floods threatened trenches, and the weight of overlying matrix made recovery painstakingly slow. Yet, with each specimen, the evidence mounted. This was not a graveyard left by drought or disease, but the aftermath of a sudden catastrophic event that buried an entire herd in a matter of hours. Lab benches at the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum are crowded with thin section slides and sediment cores, each one holding a clue to what really happened at Pipestone Creek. Diagnosing the cause of death starts with what isn't there. Under a microscope, the bone tissue of Pachyrinosaurus from the site shows no signs of chronic disease. No periosteal lesions, no abnormal growths, no trace of infection that would sweep through a herd. Pathology scans confirm the skeletons are free of the scars or stunted growth rings that would betray starvation or long-term drought. Instead, the bones display healthy, uninterrupted growth, even in the youngest animals. Isotope data, when available, show no shift toward water stress or malnutrition, further excluding environmental collapse as a factor. Volcanic disaster leaves a different fingerprint. In mass death sites caused by ashfall, the sediment is laced with volcanic glass and mineral shards, easy to spot even in low magnification. Here, the mudstone and sandstone reveal no such inclusions. Geochemical scans for elements like silicon and aluminum, which spike during volcanic events, come back at baseline. The matrix is strictly fluvial, laid down by water, not by fire from above. Regional stratigraphy supports this. There's no tuff or ash bed in the Wapiti formation at this level, only the interbedded sands and clays of a dynamic floodplain. The evidence for drought, disease, or volcanic eruption simply doesn't materialize under scrutiny. What remains is a forensic profile that matches only one scenario. The sediment surrounding the bones is composed of rapidly deposited, fine-grained silt and sand with water-laid laminations and subtle ripple marks. The arrangement of bones, jumbled, vertical, sometimes articulated, points to a sudden, 
high energy event. Thin section microscopy of the encasing mudstone reveals a lack of weathering, little exposure to air, and no time for scavengers to clean the site. Every metric, from velocity estimates to mineral composition, rules out slow death or volcanic catastrophe, leaving catastrophic flooding as the only viable explanation. In January 2011, floodwaters swept across Queensland, Australia, turning farmland into a shallow inland sea. More than 10,000 cattle drowned in a matter of hours. Eyewitnesses described the chaos, herds bunching together, animals pressed against fences and each other, unable to escape as the water kept rising. When the water receded, carcasses lay tangled in drifts, some piled three or four deep, their bodies locked in the same positions they tried to hold as a group. The pattern was unmistakable, a mass death driven not by predators or disease, but by the instincts that usually keep herd animals safe. A similar scene plays out every year along the Mara River in East Africa. During the wildebeest migration, thousands of animals charge into the water at once, driven by urgency and the pressure of the crowd behind them. Steep banks and strong currents funnel the herd into narrow crossings. Panic spreads with each slip or stumble. In a single crossing, as many as 6,000 wildebeest can drown, their bodies swept downstream and deposited in dense, chaotic clusters. Ecologists studying these events have documented how herd behavior, so effective against lions and hyenas, can turn deadly when the threat comes from the environment itself. The fossil arrangement at Pipestone Creek echoes these modern disasters. Mixed ages, tangled skeletons, and dense packing are all signatures of a herd caught off guard by a sudden, overwhelming flood. Just as with cattle in Queensland, or wildebeest in the Mara, the Pachyrhinosaurus herd's greatest strength, sticking together, became a fatal vulnerability when the rules of survival changed in an instant. The parallels between ancient and modern mass drownings are not just striking. They confirm that the flash flood scenario at Pipestone Creek is not only possible, but expected when social animals meet catastrophic water. Herding offers safety most of the time, but in the face of a rising torrent, it can offer no escape. Panic does not move in a straight line through a herd. It ricochets, doubling back on itself, amplifying with every startled movement. At Pipestone Creek, the fossil record captures this chaos in stone. Agent-based simulations run by paleontologists show that when a sudden threat, like a wall of water, hits a dense, mixed-age group, the reaction is instantaneous. Adults, weighing four tons or more, instinctively close ranks around the youngest. Instead of scattering, the herd compresses, each animal responding to the fear of its neighbor. Dr. Michael Ryan has compared this to what happens in modern bison or elephant herds. The most vulnerable are shielded at the center, but in a bottleneck, that protection becomes a trap. Excavation maps reveal density spikes at natural choke points, places where the landscape funneled bodies into tighter and tighter spaces. Here, bone counts soar past 300 per square meter, with juveniles and adults tangled together. The sheer mass of flesh and bone blocked any hope of escape. As the floodwaters rose, the herd's greatest strength, its unity, became a liability. In the final moments, muscle and instinct could do nothing against the force of water and the press of the crowd. The fossil bed is a silent record of panic. Skeletons jumbled, limbs interlocked, generations lost in a single surge. Dr. Ryan's commentary underscores the tragic logic. Herd loyalty, so effective against predators, offered no defense when the enemy was the river itself. Field work at Pipestone Creek now relies on tools that would have seemed like science fiction to the first crews. LiDAR mapping sweeps the landscape with lasers, capturing every rise and hollow of the ancient floodplain to sub-centimeter precision. These digital models let researchers reconstruct the topography as it was 73 million years ago, revealing subtle channels and depressions where water once pooled and surged. With each new scan, patterns emerge, bone clusters lining up with old riverbanks, density spikes at natural choke points, offering clues about how the floodwaters trap the herd. Back in the lab, 
CT scanners peer inside fossil blocks without a single cut. Skull fragments from the site, including the famous Big Sam, are imaged layer by layer, exposing microfractures and growth rings invisible to the naked eye. These scans uncover details like healed injuries, tooth wear, and even the tiny stress marks left by the animal's final moments. Combined with 3D modeling, paleontologists can now test how bones broke, how bodies piled up, and how the herd moved in its last seconds. This wave of technology is opening new channels of evidence, raising questions that would have been impossible to ask a decade ago. How many flood pulses swept the site? Did the herd die in a single surge, or were there survivors who returned later? The answers may still be buried, but the tools to find them are sharper than ever. Unanswered questions still crowd the edge of every trench at Pipestone Creek. How many Pachyrinosaurus actually died here? Hundreds or several thousand? Did the catastrophe strike in a single overwhelming surge? Or did the site record a series of disasters, spaced days or even years apart? Recent isotope analyses hint at a herd that may have migrated vast distances before their final stand, but the full story of their journey remains locked inside the bones. Excavation plans stretch decades ahead. With more than a square kilometer of fossil-rich ground, researchers estimate it will take a century or more to uncover the entire site. Each new layer brings not just answers, but more puzzles. Subtle shifts in sediment, unexpected clusters of juveniles, hints of survivors that never made it far. As the science advances, so does the partnership with the region's indigenous communities. The Cree Nation, whose oral histories long described the River of Bones, now works alongside scientists to guide stewardship and protect the land for future generations. These collaborations shape how fossils are studied, displayed, and even who tells their story. In the end, Pipestone Creek is not just a window into the ancient past, it's a living research site where every discovery opens the door to new mysteries and the work of understanding is shared across generations. At Pipestone Creek, over 8,000 Pachyrhinosaurus fossils, spanning every age group, lie packed in a single layer of sediment. Forensic evidence confirms a flash flood swept through this herd 73 million years ago, burying them instantly. Their collective strength, herding, parental care, and migration became their undoing in the face of disaster. No evidence points to drought or disease, and sediment analysis rules out volcanic activity. Yet, questions remain. The true size of the original herd, whether more than one event is recorded here, and how many individuals survived. Ongoing excavations using LIDAR and CT scans may take another century to answer these. The fossil record at Pipestone Creek demonstrates evolution's double edge. The social behavior that protected Pachyrinosaurus for millions of years could not guarantee survival against sudden change. Today, mass animal deaths from floods and habitat shifts show this risk is not just ancient history, but an ongoing reality.